when you get invited to EG, one of the things they try to impress on you is to um, be vulnerable, um, which for me means coming up here completely unarmed. I'm not here to hack into anything today. Um, last time I was here, I showed you how to hack into hotel TV networks, control what your neighbors are watching, how to steal passwords with robots, make a passive surveillance network to follow your friends around using Bluetooth. How to meet chicks on MySpace. How to meet chicks on MySpace using spam filters. How to pick locks, steal cars, hack into Mike Hawley's voicemail. Steal credit cards. <laughs> steal credit cards without even uh, getting them out of your pocket. I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. Uh, Got to get out of the way, though. Um, I'm completely unarmed, and I'm going to talk about what we work on at the lab. So Intellectual Ventures Lab, we're trying to um, essentially, both make markets for inventors, celebrate inventors, make being an inventor a legitimate career path. Um, since I'm the guy with no legitimate career path, I don't know how I end up here. We have every tool in the world, and um, we come up with ideas, and we try to test them out and see if they're going to work. A lot of times we do this by bringing folks in who have problems, maybe big problems, they don't really know what to do about, and they kind of get a chance to come in and work with us because we have a wild array of um, experts. So not just computer hackers, we have chemists, nuclear physicists, um, you know, microscopists, photonics guys, oh, is this zipping too fast? Anyway, machine shop, laser lab, whatever. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. You should all come check it out. Um, this is a culinary sciences lab for food. So we've been trying to look into the science of cooking and science of making food. We think that this is a big market, and it's growing. So uh, we're making a cookbook. It's an 1,800-page tome on the science of cooking with a bunch of modernist recipes. This is partly Nathan's uh, uh, particular interest. But in our kitchen, we have a rotary evaporator and a quarter-million-dollar homogenizer. Um, <laughs> Uh, actually, a freeze dryer from a pharmaceutical lab, bandsaw, drill press, all kinds of things you wouldn't find in an ordinary kitchen. Um, and we're hoping to make, you know, the George Foreman version of those things for your kitchen in the future. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> anyway, first thing we're making is a cookbook. It's taken years to do, and it's going to weigh like 70 pounds and come on a pallet. And, you know, anyway, but it's got great, great stuff in it. Um, in the lab, we bring a lot of these sort of scientific tools to that. Uh, both the cooking and other stuff, and this is just because it's cool. I don't have any reason. <laughs> um, but we're able to do things that you can't do also in, in uh, investigating things like cooking. And so this is showing popcorn because it's pretty. So the point of the, that I do want to try and make when I'm talking about this stuff, this is like the lamest possible slide. This shows a protocol diagram. For SSL, which is like the encryption in your web browser, in your computer, whenever you talk to websites. This is what protects you when you log into your bank and keeps your password from getting stolen by guys like me. What a hacker will do is assess this at every point in the protocol. Is this working? What is this supposed to do? What happens if I put a zero here instead of a one? Maybe I can get your password. What do you know? A lot of times you can do that. This is more like what that might look like to a hacker. These guys are a big problem. And this is a protocol diagram for malaria, which is a really big problem, currently claiming about a million kids a year in Africa. Right? So this is a problem where, uh, in this case, Bill Gates asked us to work on this, figure out what we can do to help with eradicating malaria. And so we try to come up with some inventions. And um, we attack this at every point along the way. Malaria has a very complex life cycle. What's going on here is it spends a little time inside of a mosquito, it spends a little time inside of a human, and it has to do that in order to continue to procreate. In the past, we've eradicated the malaria from almost everywhere except for Africa. There's a few exceptions. And we did it largely by spraying DDT. And this stuff works really well, but uh, it's politically unpopular and it could cause problems for other stuff. But anyway, um, we're looking for other ways to do it. And the ways that we come up with, we can test using uh, computer models. So we have now um, probably the largest epidemiological modeling team in the world, 
creating Monte Carlo simulations for the spread of malaria in Africa. And, um, oops, anyway, that was the model. I accidentally bounced past it. But basically, the point is uh, we simulate in the same way that a photograph uh, has color on every pixel, values for that. We, we model the climate, rainfall, travel of humans, all this kind of data. This is Madagascar turned on its side so it fits on the screen. Eventually, we'll do this for all of Africa. And by using Monte Carlo simulations, we can simulate exactly what's going on in each part of, in each pixel of Madagascar, right? And we can see what's happening. When we perform an intervention, like in bring in bed nets, spray DDT, or other things, we can see how effective it's going to work. So we can plot a campaign and get rid of this once and for all. Um, these guys, uh, we came up with a couple of ideas around this. Probably the most notorious is uh, we find mosquitoes flying around in the sky and shoot them down with laser beams, <laughs> which um, pretty much whatever your problem is, we can find a solution that involves lasers. But this, <laughs> this is a particularly good one because no one likes mosquitoes. And, and uh, you know the way this works is, is pretty straightforward. It's a uh, direct descendant of Star Wars, I would say. We, look for, we use optics to find mosquitoes flying around up to about 100 feet away at the moment. Um, we aim a laser at them. We sample their wing beat frequency to determine, is this a mosquito? Is it Anopheles defensi? Is it female? And then we fire a lethal laser at it. <laughs> and the idea is you could set something like this up. This is a, what we call the photonic fence. So each of those fence posts has a laser rig on it that is looking uh, to span an area of 100 feet or more. And it can tell if the thing coming by is flapping its wings like a mosquito or flapping its wings like a toddler and choose what to shoot. And so um, this is a case you know, where uh, what we think is that we started out with a humanitarian approach, but you might want this for your backyard. And hey, maybe we can protect crops with it too. And there's ways that we can actually take some of these humanitarian projects and turn them into commercial inventions as well. So most of the stuff I'm talking about today um, is, is stuff, I think, from the humanitarian angle that's not encumbered by patent issues or whatever. But you can see that we might make some money off it anyway. Um, I, you know, that's a pretty picture. <laughs> More pictures of, you know, we, this is actually meant to illustrate that we don't kill the males because they actually don't carry malaria. We could if we want, but it saves, saves energy. And <laughs> it's a low power. It only kills those you know, that are female. And then uh, we don't kill, you know, the harmless bees and butterflies and things. Uh, anyway, <laughs> interesting point about how we operate. I think that's that's worth noting is that, if anything, what we bring to the, you know, bring to the table from an invention perspective and otherwise, is a relative lack of fear of scale. Um, we don't mind using lasers. We'll work on pretty large scale projects. In the case of this uh, invention, what I'm trying to show here is. It's made from the components that follow Moore's law. It's the laser from a, a Blu-ray burner, a CCD from a typical video camera, the chip from a PlayStation that does uh, you know, vector processing is what we use for analyzing the image, and you know, infrared flashlights and, and stuff like that. Anyway, the point is, all this stuff follows Moore's law. So what we use in the lab now might cost thousands of dollars in lab gear. Give us a few years. You can basically plot a curve for the the cost of those components, and someday we'll get to 20 bucks and we can ship it to Africa. So we're thinking a little further out in the future, usually five or 10 years, and that's a space where we don't have a lot of competition. Everybody else has to try and ship a product next year. We don't have to do that, so we're able to come up with a lot of stuff that, that uh, other people can't work on. Um, one of our big ideas we've been working on is what to do about hurricanes. These things are pretty devastating, claim a lot of lives and money. So the way a hurricane works is it's fueled by heat radiating off the surface of the ocean, right? That heat rises up, hurricane goes faster and faster. In our invention, what we do is we stick a giant tube in the ocean. And waves, handy source of energy, push all the hot water on the surface into the top of the tube. That creates a pump with no moving parts. The hot water comes out 200 meters below, mixes up with the plenty of cold water that's available. Maybe if you put thousands of these things in the ocean, you could cool the surface by 
half a degree or a degree, enough to make a Cat 5 into a Cat 4. It's a very large scale project, but it's simple enough and arguably cheap enough, cheaper than the cost of the, of the damage from a hurricane, that maybe we should consider these things. Uh, we also came up with some ideas related to reversing the effects of global warming. This is probably the most notorious. It's called the strata shield. So the strata shield is spitting sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, maybe uh, 20 kilometers up, right? And so what it's doing up there is scattering sunlight before it gets to the earth, before it heats up these greenhouse gases. And so what we figured out was maybe a cheap way of doing that is just run a big hose up. So these triangular looking things are helium balloons, hauling a garden hose up to the sky, 20 kilometers up, spitting out a little bit of SO2, what a garden hose can carry, right? One of those things in the Arctic we think would be enough to restore Arctic ice conditions to pre-industrial levels. That means the levels that the ice was at before humans started messing with, uh, with the environment, with uh, emissions. So again, a large scale crazy idea, but this thing is so cheap we can almost not afford to try it. Is that, did I get a double negative in there? <laughs> the, and so with geoengineering schemes in the past, a lot of times they've been discounted because they're ridiculously expensive. Here we're just showing one that's cost effective enough that somebody could do it if they got bored. We think this can be done for tens of millions of dollars, not billions. And so we want to research these things. They're just new ideas. We need help researching them, figuring out all the side effects and things like that. Um, interestingly, spitting SO2 into the stratosphere was not our idea. That's what nature does. Volcanoes, whenever they erupt, shoot SO2 into the environment. We got to instrument this when Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines blew up, and I think it was 1991. We got to see, over the course of the next year or so, about a one degree drop on average for the globe's temperature, right? So these simulations uh, just show, uh, over the course of like 60 years, what happens to the ice levels. Um, you can see this is what's going on right now, and we get dangerously down to zero. Right? There's, I think they're not the most compelling illustrations. <laughs> Somebody's going to get fired. No. Um, so this is an example of another huge problem humanity has. These huge stainless steel containers um, contain depleted uranium. So for our current generation of reactors, what we do is we dig uranium out of the ground and we put it through an enrichment process that spits out a little bit of fissionable material, plutonium and the like. That's about 3% of the energy that's in the uranium to begin with. We take that stuff, we put it in our reactors and burn it, and then we generate a little bit of toxic waste. And all that stuff from the enrichment process and after burning in reactors goes in these casks and we don't have a real big plan for what to do with it, so we just store it. Here's a stockpile in Kentucky of 700,000 metric tons of nuclear waste sitting around. We don't really have a plan for what to do with it. We kind of wave our arms and pretend there's a plan. So we decided, let's make a reactor powered by that stuff. It's just sitting around. 97% of the energy is just sitting there. So our largest project now is a um, nuclear reactor design that in fact runs on nuclear waste. It, there's no moving parts. It's the kind of thing that's safe in the way that modern reactor designs should be safe. But it burns like a candle from one end to the other over the course of about 60 years, and then you just leave it in place. And we can just drop uh, uranium in it instead of enriched fuel so we can get rid of the enrichment program. This illustrates what's happening. You take uranium, you blast it little, with a little bit of fissionable material using a uh, nuclear reaction. That creates uh, the enrichment in the reactor itself, enriches the fuel, and then burns it. We call it a traveling wave reactor, and you can see what's happening here as it burns from one end to the other. Kind of light it like a, like a fuse on one end. The leading wave there is causing enrichment. This is over the course of 60 years in our design. And the second wave is burning the fuel right there in the reactor. We now have the world's largest advanced nuclear research team working on this, which means about 35 people. And that, that should tell you is that nobody else is really trying very hard. And so you know, give us some time, and hopefully we'll get this thing working. The photo that I showed you of the stockpile in our reactors represents about uh, 3,000 years of energy in our reactors. So we don't even have to dig up more uranium. 
And that's it for me.